In this lecture, we're going to look at the relationship between scientists' theoretical beliefs and uh, the reliance on observation in conducting science, uh, you know, using the five senses. So let's just get started. Science relies on sensory observations, most, you know, from what we consider the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Oh. Ultimately, most scientists' theoretical beliefs or claims or hypotheses come from some sort of sensory observation. You know, scientists will gather observational data, such as these biologists in the field observing geese. This data motivates hypotheses about the world, such as the hypothesis that the purpose of goose honks is to attract mates. The scientists will test the hypotheses. And this results in more observational data. For example, a scientist would want to observe what's actually going on when a goose is honking. Oh, he's hissing. Oh. Oh. <laughs> then, implausible hypotheses in light of the observational data are discarded. For example, goose honks aren't only for attracting mates. Acceptable hypotheses are retained and their implications are further explored. For example, the connection between goose honks and potential predators. So here's a concern, though. Science is reliant on sensory observations. Uh, a concern that's been raised by psychologists and philosophers of science and sociologists of science in the past is that if scientific claims are rejected or accepted on the basis of sensory observations, then the reliability of a scientific claim depends on the reliability of the sensory observations. Here's a bad practice, though. A scientist shouldn't reject a hypothesis merely because it didn't fit with prior observations that were made in poor conditions or bad conditions, such as poor lighting. Or, for example, suppose a scientist was slipped a hallucinogenic drug unbeknownst to the scientist, so they saw things that weren't there. They would want to redo the experiment when there are, you know, they're not on hallucinogenics. So uh, that's a caveat. Uh, there's kind of an analogy with selfies, you know. As all social media influencers know, the proper way to take a selfie is to hold the camera above your face, look up at the camera, and, you know, maybe make a duck face. Like this? No. More like this. Here's the concern, though. Again, if scientific claims are rejected or accepted, on the basis of sensory observations, then the reliability of a scientific claim depends, again, on the reliability of the sensory observations. If the sensory observations themselves are not reliable, then the scientific claim is not reliable. The unreliability of the sensory observations infects the reliability of the scientific claim. It, it, you could think of it as like contaminating it, just like you know, contaminated food will you know, cause people to become ill. So if our observations are unreliable, then that threatens the objectivity of science. Yet we need science to be objective. Our lives literally depend on it. As we know, when, if you're, for example, if you're taking various types of medicine or if uh, you're reliant on engineered technology that is reliant on sciences themselves uh, for safety. Uh, and I could think of a variety of other applications where our lives depend on the objectivity of science. So we need science to be objective. Our lives literally depend on it. However, our observations are fallible. Oh my God! Okay, stop being dramatic. But this, think about this though. Ever notice someone far off in the distance that you think you've correctly identified? Look, up there on top of that hill. Is that a chicken? See it right there? Nope. Instead, you find out that you misidentify it when you get closer to it. In this case, it's my Uncle Frank in his chicken costume again. So what we take as an observable fact is not immune to change. Um, in fact, our human perception is prone to systematic errors. Check out this young woman. See, this young woman, probably from the 1920s. However, this image can be viewed also as an old woman. So this image can be viewed as an old or young woman 
But how subjects perceive this image depends on how they are primed. This is a famous example in many psychology textbooks. Kind of a, involves a gestalt shift. Uh, I primed you into seeing a young woman. You know, here's her uh, dainty little nose and her uh, eyelashes and her jawline right there uh, and her, her ear and her neck. But you could also be primed to see an image of an old woman. Uh, you're primed to see a young woman. Uh, but like, you know, uh, let me reset the pen. You know, if you could see a old woman, here's the nose, here's an eye, here's the mouth, here's the chin. So uh, depending on how, how subjects are primed, uh, that impacts how they perceive it oftentimes. Of course, maybe you were not because you've probably seen this before. It's a well-known example in psychology textbooks. Uh, but nonetheless, changes in context, your motives, your emotional state, your cultural upbringing, all of these affect your perceptions. Your experiences and observation reports then are going to be influenced by your expectations. What you experience and then what you report to others that you've experienced will be influenced by your expectations. This applies to scientists as well. Scientists are humans as well. According to many philosophers of science, our observations are theory-laden. Um, basically, our theoretical beliefs impact what we see. Okay, uh, And this applies especially to scientists. Their theoretical beliefs impact what they observe. So if our, observer, um, if our observations are theory-laden, then the scientific theories we embrace might influence our sensory experiences. So basically, your scientific beliefs influence what you actually perceive. So, I mean, do you think, think about this. Do heliocentric and geocentric astronomers see the same thing when they see the sunrise? Geocentric astronomers thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. So the Earth was stationary. It was not moving. So the sun is literally moving around the Earth. Whereas heliocentric astronomers think, no, the Earth is moving around the sun. So while the sun looks like it's moving around Earth, really the Earth is moving around the sun. Do they see the same thing? Uh, this is you know, something we're thinking about. Uh, well, here's the old view. Uh, the plausibility of your observation reports are independent of your theoretical beliefs. Your theoretical beliefs have no impact on what you observe. Okay, You can kind of put a wall between them. You can separate them. They're shielded from each other. Okay, uh, But there's a wealth of psychological evidence that challenges this. Uh, so here's the deal. If different theoretical beliefs result in different observations, then appealing to observations is not an objective way to evaluate competing scientific theories. So um, here's the deal. Humans are not blank slates that passively receive sensory information like Bud right here. You know, he sees it, you know, he, he was born knowing nothing and then, you know, he, information just gets dumped into his brain. There's a lot of processing that goes on when we're perceiving the world around us using the five senses. Okay, a whole lot of processing. There's a wealth of neuroscientific and cognitive scientific evidence for this. Vision involves unconscious inferences from both retinal images and unconscious assumptions about the world. Uh, you've probably seen this as well, the famous Mueller-Lear illusion. No, I don't mean that Robert Mueller was a magician. Bad joke. Instead, I'm talking about this image that you've also probably seen, since it's in many psychology textbooks. It's the Mueller-Lear illusion. These two horizontal lines are the same length. The line at the top and the line at the bottom are the exact same length. But they seem like they are different in length. It seems like the top line is longer than the bottom line, and the bottom line is shorter than the top line. They're the same length, but the top line looks longer. Again, even if you, when you know the lines are equal in length, this illusion persists. You can't help but see the two lines as differing in length. Even after you measure them, the top line seems longer than the bottom line. Okay, So this is a very robust illusion. It is stable. It does not go away, no matter what you learn. So according to the, uh, the philosopher of mine, Jerry Fodor, who is also kind of one of the founders of cognitive science, these illusions are robust. 
Our background beliefs influence what we see, and we can't seem to change these background beliefs. But our perceptual experiences are influenced by some background beliefs, but not others, okay? So we have other backgrounds. So we acquired the background belief that these two lines are not the same in length. But it seems like we have another background belief in there that won't go with it. It says, no, they're the same in length. Uh, so some beliefs influence our perceptual experiences. Other beliefs we have do not influence our perceptual experiences. So this is the significance of this observation. It is unclear whether working with different scientific theories has any important influence over our observations. It may be the case that scientific beliefs don't influence what scientists see. And perhaps that means they don't threaten the objectivity of science. We're going to explore this. Um, so the question is, are scientific theories like the belief I get after I measure the line in the mueller lee illusion? That is, are they beliefs that do not influence my perception? Or are scientific theories beliefs that actually do influence our sensory experiences? If so, if it is the case that scientific theories are beliefs that do influence your sensory experiences, does that challenge the authority and the objectivity and the reliability of scientific conclusions? This is what we're going to be exploring. So here's some caveats. Our observation reports are always fallible. But we can correct for that much of the time. Okay. However, if the fact that our observations are theory-laden is to provide a distinctive challenge to science, then the challenge must indicate more than mere fallibility. So we need a challenge to the idea that our theoretical beliefs impact what we perceive sometimes that shows that you know it's not just not evidence that they're merely fallible. We need something more than just that. Um, is there evidence that different scientific beliefs affect the way scientists observe the world or report observations? That's what we're looking for. And if there is such evidence, is that a threat to the objectivity of science? Yeah. Is that evidence that science is less objective? So here's something I want to tell you right now. Scientific training actually does change the way scientists experience the world. Normal people, for example, see babies as this sweet thing that they want to care for, like this new father of this newborn. Look at this sweet, tender baby of mine. I will always love and protect my child. Whereas, you know, scientists are scientists. You know, let's see what happens when this infant is placed in a sensory deprivation chamber. But I'm not talking about that. Uh, but here's the deal. The fact is, scientific training does change the way scientists experience the world. But that's a problem only if the training produces in scientists a tendency to observe things that aren't really there. Like, you know, scientific induced training that induces hallucinations. Like this poor guy. But, in fact, the opposite is the case. Scientific training does change the way scientists perceive the world, but it doesn't necessarily threaten scientific objectivity. Okay, let me show you some examples. Students, when they look through a microscope at a cell, like, you know, amoeba, perhaps, they're not going to be able to identify features of cells that, uh, you know, someone with a PhD in microbiology will be able to identify, okay? So the microbiologist sees things that the student does not see when looking through a microscope as a result of the many years of scientific training. But we wouldn't say that the microbiologist is less objective. We'd say that the microbiologist has been able to acquire even more knowledge uh, because of the training, okay? Or with medical doctors as well. When an ordinary person sees an x-ray of lungs, for example, they might see splotches. But, you know, when an oncologist looks at an x-ray, they might be able to see dangerous tumors. Okay? So, again, the training of an oncologist impacts what they see when looking at x-rays. But we wouldn't say that makes it less reliable, less objective. We'd say it's almost more objective, more reliable. Their training allows them to see more than the scientific layperson sees. Okay? So, again... Theoretical beliefs that are acquired by scientists change what they observe, but that doesn't mean it, but that's, you would almost say it's for the better. They can see more as a result of the training rather than see less. So scientific training does result in different perceptual experiences, but this does not obviously challenge the objectivity of science because we have plenty of examples where the training increases the kind of uh, scientific, the capacities of the scientists, okay? Um, they're able to acquire more knowledge as a result of it.
Uh, so again, though, sometimes observations are unreliable. That's still true. Scientists themselves make unreliable observations. But also, sometimes this is just simply because scientists are stretching the limits of what we can observe. All right? It's hard to identify someone from a mile away than from 10 feet away. Again, who is this person on the beach right there? I can't tell if they're too far away. Oh, it's my Uncle Frank again. <laughs> Got me again. Um, so again, like distant, fast-moving objects or very small objects are vulnerable to alternative interpretations. Uh, that's, you know, it's not obvious when we look far away through telescopes that some features of faraway galaxies are black holes or something else. Or a string theory deals with the very, very small, uh, you know, are quarks and electrons ultimately like vibrating strings? Uh, well, I mean, this is there's many alternative interpretations consistent with the data that we have right now. Uh, this is literally at the, the limits of human knowledge. Okay. Um, on the other hand, though, scientists have made a lot of progress in molecular biology and genetics and chemistry in the past half century. Way more progress than they made in cosmology and subatomic physics. Um, because this is more medium-sized objects. Uh, and you may think about how quickly we got the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and it seems like it's the rollout's going slow, but still, they were able to, you know, the vaccine that's being distributed right now has been around since February. I just had to pass all the uh, clinical trials. But uh, so, I mean, in some scientists that look at like mid-sized objects or slightly, or much, I mean, and in fact, there's a molecules are a lot bigger than a subatomic particle, okay? an enzyme or a string of DNA is way bigger than an electron. Um, uh, we've made lots of advances there. I mean, an insane amount of progress in these fields, okay? Uh, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and there's less alternative interpretations in these fields as a result compared to, say, you know, you know, subatomic physics, where, you know, we're just moving at a very snail's, we're moving at a snail's pace right now. With lot and spending lots of money, it took a lot of time to get the Higgs to discover the Higgs boson. Uh, the Human Genome Project also took a long time, but then as a result of it, they were able to map the genomes of pretty much any living thing right now in like a very short amount of time. So, uh, all here's the deal, though. Sometimes different data emerges from different labs. You know. Okay, yeah. Here's an old meme from back in the day. Sorry, that's a faux pas. Um, what do you do when different data emerges from different labs? This is an important question. Sometimes different labs will have different data. Uh, well, again, the differences might be unclear. It might be that the experimenters had different expectations. They might have had different theoretical commitments. It's true. Uh, sometimes, though, upon closer inspection, these disagreements are brought to conclusion. Both labs will share their data. They'll communicate with each other, and they'll see what where the discrepancies were, and then they will reevaluate, and then they might come to an agreement. This happens a lot, okay? So, like, the fact that uh, scientists initially disagree on something isn't a reason for skepticism. You need to think about the particulars of the case. And oftentimes, this skepticism gets resolved upon further inspection. Anyways, we're going to tell a specific story, though, and then part two of this lecture about an uh, important case where two different scientific groups reached different conclusions in, on a disagreement about data uh, that had ma major implications for how we understand one of the most important scientific topics of our time. To learn about that, watch part two.